Okay, um, very good morning, everyone. Good Friday morning. Um, welcome to the, this uh, virtual seminar series organized by the uh, NUS Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions. My name is Lian Pin. I am the director of the uh, Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions and also the host for today's uh, seminar. Um, it's, it's a very special seminar for us because uh, I think for the first time we have over 500 people who registered for this, uh, this seminar and, and so we had to, uh, uh, it's a bit of a, has a hassle earlier uh, to try to live stream this uh, through Facebook to accommodate the, the people who, uh, who would not be able to sign in to, uh, to, to Zoom. Um, but, but I think we've got that figured out. Um, and so before we begin, I have a few housekeeping details. Um, during the seminar, please keep your microphones muted. Uh, note that the session is recorded and will, will be posted on YouTube later. So today we have uh, Associate Professor Daniel Fries from the NUS Department of Geography. Dan is also the Deputy Director of the uh, Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions. Dan's research in coastal geography uses ecosystem services to investigate um, changes to coastal ecosystems and how best to protect them. In particular, Dan investigates blue carbon in mangrove forests. He is uh, obsessed about mangroves, as many of us know. Uh, he hates the mangrove lab, of course, no surprise there. Uh, and the mangrove lab focuses on quantifying ecosystem services, measuring sea level rise, uh, studying deforestation, and researching mangrove restoration and policy. Dan is also a lead principal investigator for uh, the project uh, that assesses uh, Singapore's natural capital. And uh, he's also a member of the IUCN mangrove specialist group. So the topic of uh, Dan's talk today is about mangrove blue carbon in Southeast Asia. This topic is highly relevant, very topical, um, given the increasing interest on how blue carbon ecosystems such as mangroves can help uh, mitigate global climate change due to their high rates of carbon sequestration and storage. And as we know, Southeast Asia is a global hotspot for mangrove blue carbon, and the region is also a hotspot for deforestation at the same time. So land use drivers such as land use change drivers such as aquaculture and rice cultivation have different impacts on carbon emissions. And to address these issues, mangrove restoration can potentially increase uh, blue carbon storage and sequestration and, uh, the, and potentially even generate uh, mangrove blue carbon credits that can be financially viable and potentially more efficient than terrestrial carbon uh, credit projects. So without further ado, um, I'll pass the time to Dan to uh, begin uh, his talk. Over to you, Dan. Thanks very much, Abby Ampin. Uh, thanks everyone. And um, it, it's great to see so many people interested uh, in blue carbon. It's certainly a, a becoming a really hot topic. Um, I, can everyone see my screen? Yep. Okay. Um, so first of all, before I even start, I just want to acknowledge that what I'm about to present is actually the culmination of a lot of people's work uh, that I've been kind of lucky and privileged to be involved in. Uh, so a number of different organizations have, I've worked with in Blue Carbon have really kind of shaped my thinking and, and shaped a lot of the ideas that you're going to hear. And particularly a, a shout out to the Mangrove Lab who are doing some awesome work on Blue Carbon and, and related things, particularly with mangroves. Uh, so just want to acknowledge uh, right up front that, that what I'm presenting is really a big team effort and, and I'm just lucky to be able to present it. Okay, now blue carbon is a huge topic, even though it's a, a relatively new one, it, it's expanded uh, in ways that I think a lot of researchers didn't imagine. Um, and I, in the next 30 minutes, I can't you know, begin to do blue carbon justice, uh, but I'm gonna focus instead on three things. First of all, what is blue carbon? Um, how much of blue carbon are we losing due to deforestation and land use change? And then the third point is a bit of a reality check on, on blue carbon because we're, it has accelerated at such a, a rapid rate. Um, and a lot of things that we thought 
were maybe true when we were first promoting this this concept uh, we've now kind of got a, a a more uh, robust idea about. So I think it's, you know, we're at the stage in this paradigm now where we can start to, to critique it a little bit and, and make sure that what we're communicating is really is uh, the best knowledge uh, for conservation. Uh, so those, those are the three things I'll cover. Um, as the Ampin said, I love mangroves. So there's a lot of mangroves in this uh, presentation, but I think a lot of the concepts are actually relevant to other blue carbon ecosystems as well. So just bear that in mind. Um, as we go through. Okay. So I'll start off by um, showing you the, the carbon rainbow, uh, of which there are many colors. Carbon is very colorful now. And first of all, we, we talked about black and brown carbon. These were bad carbons. These were our emissions and, and things like that. And then we talked about red carbon, which was um, melting uh, glaciers and things. But then on the flip side, there's a whole part of the rainbow, which is good carbon. And these are um, carbon as sinks uh, of our emissions. So green carbon is you know, tropical forests and temperate forests, et cetera. Um, any vegetated uh, ecosystem that was able to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Green carbon has recently been split into lots of different colors, depending on the type of uh, ecosystem that is doing the carbon sequestration. And I'll be talking about blue carbon, which is vegetated coastal habitats, uh, but there's also teal and, and gold carbon uh, that have been recently promoted as other um, important sinks of our atmospheric carbon dioxide emissions. So blue carbon, which I'll focus on at the moment, uh, refers to mangrove forest, salt marshes, sea grasses, and tidal freshwater forested wetlands. These are the four um, kind of universally acknowledged blue carbon habitats. And how did we decide that these four habitats uh, could become under this blue carbon umbrella? Well, there's a paper last year that, that gave, gave the kind of the six or seven key criteria uh, to qualify as a blue carbon habitat. So if it's going to be a blue carbon habitat, first of all, it has to have a substantial scale of um, greenhouse gas removals from the atmosphere. And blue carbon ecosystems do this really well. As you can see in this graph here, which compares the um, sequestration rates uh, at the plot level for uh, lots of different ecosystems. And you can see that uh, blue carbon ecosystems, seagrass, mangroves, and salt marshes sequester a lot more uh, carbon per unit area than these other ecosystems do. So you get a lot more kind of bang for your buck uh, with blue carbon uh, ecosystems. They also have to be able to store carbon uh, over the long term. And again, mangroves do this very well. And this is a, a famous graph that really kicked off a lot of the, the uh, excitement in blue carbon by showing how much of the carbon is stored in the soil in blue carbon ecosystems, in this case, mangroves compared to other forest types. So, you know, the idea is that you, you can accumulate soil carbon over thousands of years, keep it locked up as long as there is, is still a blue carbon habitat on top of it. Some other criteria uh, which make it useful for conservation includes, are these ecosystems that are experiencing negative impacts uh, from, uh, from human activity? And linked to that, are there achievable management actions that we can do to actually protect this blue carbon uh, stock? And will those management actions have co-benefits and coastal ecosystems uh, have a huge number of co-benefits alongside carbon, which we sometimes forget about. And I will talk about that towards the end. And most importantly, if it's gonna be used for blue carbon conservation, is it an, an ecosystem that can be incorporated into existing policy? So are there policies that cover that ecosystem? Are they in jurisdictions that have um, policy control? And if it can hit all of these criteria, then it comes into a um, blue carbon habitat. So I'm gonna talk about mangroves uh, for the most of this presentation and uh, particularly mangroves in Southeast Asia. And Southeast Asia is a blue carbon hotspot uh, for seagrass, but particularly for mangrove forests. And, and these two global models uh, show this to a little extent. There are so many global models of mangrove carbon now, um, which is, is great. It's a really um, increasing area of research. And these are just you know, two uh, 
uh, out of this whole selection, but they show really well the concentration of carbon in the above ground biomass, which is the top map, and the soil carbon at the bottom map. And they show that concentration in Southeast Asia uh, really well. So we have the most amount of carbon um, anywhere in the world. And so our mangroves probably store about 2 billion tons of carbon, you know, almost, but not quite half of the world's total. And there's, there's many reasons why Southeast Asia is this uh, blue carbon hotspot. First of all, we have the biggest area of these blue carbon habitats. So Indonesia alone accounts for about 20% of the world's mangrove extent. So obviously if we have bigger area of, of habitats, we're gonna have more blue carbon. Uh, we have a climate that is conducive to highly productive mangrove ecosystems. We have a, a wet tropical climate uh, in most of Southeast Asia. So this is, you know, means we have very uh, productive mangrove systems. And also we have geomorphic settings which um, allow for the greater accumulation of carbon and sediments. So we really are the powerhouse of the world's mangrove blue carbon in Southeast Asia. Um, now, when we talk about Southeast Asia, we think about Indonesia, Vietnam, Myanmar, and areas with large mangrove extent. But I, I show this map to highlight that even in Singapore, we, we do have some blue carbon hotspots. We only have, you know, somewhere between kind of seven and nine kilometers of uh, square kilometers of mangroves. But those mangroves we were able to model through field surveys and remote sensing uh, that in their biomass and soil, they store uh, about 1.6 million tons of carbon dioxide. And that is, uh, that's about 10% of all the carbon stored by secondary forests, but a much smaller part of the area than what secondary forests cover. So again, in Singapore, even though we have only a small extent and highly fragmented mangrove patches, they're still able to kind of punch above their weight uh, in carbon, even in this kind of complex urban zone. So yeah, so Singapore plays a very small part in this Southeast Asia uh, uh, picture, but also as well as being a hot spot of blue carbon, we're also a hot spot of mangrove deforestation. So we're losing uh, mangroves at about 0.2 or so percent per year. Um, and that is, uh, you know, some of the countries in Southeast Asia are some of the highest uh, rates of mangrove loss in the world, particularly in Myanmar. So Southeast Asia is the global hotspot of mangrove loss, and then certain countries uh, in Southeast Asia account for a lot of that loss too. And there's lots of different causes of that loss uh, in Southeast Asia. And globally and in Southeast Asia, we often um, think about aquaculture and the conversion of mangrove forest to uh, aquaculture ponds as a major cause of mangrove loss and that certainly is uh, still in the 21st century uh, but it's not the only driver of loss so we also see uh, conversion to rice uh, urbanization etc and what's interesting to note on this map is that the drivers of mangrove loss are not equally spread across Southeast Asia different countries have different dominant drivers of mangrove loss related uh, often to kind of economic and food security policies, for example. And it's really important that we know what is causing the loss because different drivers of loss have different impacts on blue carbon that's stored in those mangroves that are being converted. So if we look at kind of annual emissions uh, globally, it's you know, somewhere between about 30 million tons uh, a year of carbon dioxide. Now, uh, to, to get these different studies comparable, I've had to do a few back of the envelope calculations and I did them about 20 minutes ago for this slide. So any errors in those numbers are mine and not the authors. Okay, I just want to uh, highlight that, but, but they all kind of give around a, a similar kind of number. And we think that in Southeast Asia, about 14 million tons of carbon dioxide is emitted a year uh, due to uh, deforestation. And in this map here, the, the pie chart uh, shows the percentage of blue carbon lost uh, between 2000 and 2012 and what was causing that loss. So for example, in Myanmar, we lost about 8% of mangrove blue carbon in those 12 years. And the majority of it was due to agriculture. And in the case of Myanmar, it was rice. 
in Indonesia, um, 2.8%, uh, three quarters of it was aquaculture, etc. So we're starting to get an idea of the magnitude of loss and what's causing it. And as I said, each uh, cause of deforestation has a slightly different impact on blue carbon. And so this uh, cartoon here shows the main uh, pathways in the carbon budget and the carbon cycle. So we have photosynthesis bringing carbon dioxide in, trees and other organisms are respiring carbon, we're accumulating in the sediment and we're exchanging it on the tide and exporting it through groundwater. And different uh, drivers of deforestation have different impacts on either photosynthesis, tidal exchange, sediment accumulation, etc. So if we're going to really project emissions, uh, we can't just assume that all causes of mangrove deforestation are the same because they're going to be having different impacts on these various pathways. And a big meta-analysis of different studies led by Sigit Sasmido showed that uh, different land use and land cover change drivers, so aquaculture, rice, etc., harvesting and others, have different impacts on above ground biomass, carbon stocks, soil carbon stocks, and uh, carbon and methane fluxes. And so, you know, all of, you know, most of them have a negative impact uh, on, on those things. So they're releasing uh, carbon or reducing uh, carbon stock accumulation, but they all do it at slightly different rates. So we can't just take an average of all of them. We need to understand what is causing the mangrove loss, and then we can apply these different emissions factors depending on the driver of loss so that we can get a much uh, more nuanced and robust uh, picture of emissions. And this was what was done in this uh, modeling study, which modeled uh, mangrove carbon emissions to the end of the century, plus the uh, amount of sequestration potential that was lost because once we deforest that mangrove, it's not able to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And so using those different emissions factors for the different causes of mangrove loss, was able to estimate that by the end of this century, uh, global emissions and this lost sequestration potential uh, due to mangrove deforestation is uh, 3,400 or so million uh, tons of carbon dioxide. And again, Southeast Asia is accounting for quite a large uh, proportion of that. So we can use, uh, we can obviously see that, that we have a big imperative to protect mangrove forests because their deforestation in Southeast Asia and elsewhere is leading to these very large uh, emissions uh, into uh, the atmosphere. And so we, we obviously want to protect mangroves so that we keep that carbon locked up in the ground. And we can do that in a couple of ways because we can put a financial value on blue carbon. There are carbon credits. Uh, the carbon credit price uh, maybe isn't as high as, as we would want it to be to incentivize conservation. But in theory, we can take the, the tons of carbon that would have been emitted and we can pay somebody the equivalent of that so that they avoid the deforestation and avoid the emissions. Or we can use blue carbon credits to restore mangrove forests uh, and, and try and kind of offset some of those emissions and, and take, up, uh, take up blue carbon. Or we can pay people to change other management practices that beyond deforestation that might be, uh, might be um, increasing blue carbon emissions. For example, uh, abandoned aquaculture ponds are an important source of methane. And if we put mangrove forests uh, onto those ponds, we get a, maybe a reduction in methane, which we can also um, put a financial value on. So there's a lot of interest in uh, blue carbon projects and the, you know, this kind of creating financial incentives to keep the blue carbon locked up in the ground uh, and not in the atmosphere. So that sounds great, right? We have high emissions. We have a, a key conservation need uh, to, to protect mangrove forests and their carbon as well as their other benefits. And we have huge uh, national and international policy interest in blue carbon, including now being discussed within uh, various aspects of the Paris Agreement. Uh, so, you know, at very high international levels. And we have this huge uh, commercial interest in the last couple of years uh, to get involved in blue carbon as part of offsetting and, and other things. So 
we have this, we're at this great stage with all of this enthusiasm and interest and, and passion for blue carbon. And so is blue carbon going to save the planet? Are we going to reduce all of our emissions uh, and stop global warming in its tracks? Uh, no, sorry to, uh, to break it to you. Uh, blue carbon is not this, this is not going to be this global panacea that we, um, that we may want it to be. So it, um, yeah, blue carbon certainly has a number of benefits, but we have to be realistic of what blue carbon as well as other um, nature-based uh, climate solutions are able to, to feasibly do. And there are a couple of kind of key limitations that I just want to touch on in the next uh, yeah, few minutes before we wrap up, um, because I think it's, it's important that we that we promote this interest and excitement about blue carbon, but in a way that is, is actually based in evidence. And so there are two things that I want to talk about, the, the scale at which blue carbon operates at and some of the challenges we find in restoring blue carbon. So I showed you this graph uh, in one of my early slides. And um, I was a bit cheeky because I didn't show you the full graph. I just showed you the top graph. And so the top graph shows that mangroves and other blue carbon habitats at the plot scale, the per hectare scale, are fantastic. They, they sequester a lot more uh, carbon per unit area than all these other ecosystems do. Unfortunately, uh, blue carbon ecosystems are relatively small in their extent. And this is because they, th yeah, there's not a huge amount of of surface area on the planet that these blue carbon ecosystems can, can grow. They're found along the coast, so they're often kind of small linear uh, ecosystems that follow the coast. Um, and so compared to the large amount of areas available for tropical rainforests, for example, the extent of blue carbon ecosystems is relatively small. Yeah, 0.4% or less of all of the um, ecosystems on the planet. So it does mean once you take that great plot scale uh, sequestration rate, but put it over the surface area of uh, blue carbon ecosystems, they turn out pretty low um, and about 1% you know, of um, global carbon sequestration per year. Now 1% is still a lot uh, and we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't minimize that uh, contribution uh, to global carbon sequestration, but obviously, you know, other uh, ecosystems have a much greater extent. So this is, um, for me, this is one of the key concepts uh, in, in blue carbon science that we have to communicate well that, you know, globally, just because of their small extent, you know, you know nothing against blue carbon ecosystems, they are working tirelessly in the background every day at really high rates. Um, but there's just not as much uh, of them as we would like. And, and so the scale of blue carbon globally is pretty small, um, but, but we do have this uh, incentive to restore them and maybe we can, we can bump it up just a, a little bit um, and increase uh, mangrove and other blue carbon habitat area through restoration to try and, and increase that a little bit more. And so there was a study uh, in 2018 uh, that showed that there was about 8,000 square kilometers of mangrove, a formerly deforested mangrove area uh, globally that might be biophysically suitable for restoration. So that it's, it's in the right kind of physical location, it's in the right uh, geomorphic setting, and, and it was recently uh, uh, deforested. So maybe there's scope to bring that back. So 8,000 square kilometers globally. Uh, the same model predicted that uh, potentially about 3,000 square kilometers of that area was in Southeast Asia. So, you know, that's a, you know, because mangroves are so good at that per hectare scale, and we have a lot of hectares even in Southeast Asia that we could potentially bring back, in part because we lost so much, right? A challenge that we face with this, however, is that restoration isn't as easy as it seems, and it should be. I mean, if you get the physical conditions right, mangroves are like weeds, they will grow everywhere. 
if you can plant them or restore the physical conditions and so that they're suitable for mangroves to survive. Because I think there's a common uh, misconception that mangroves have to grow by the sea and they like growing by the sea because we find them there, right? Actually, mangroves hate growing by the sea. It's a very stressful environment. You've got waves, you've got tidal flooding, you've got uh, high salinities. That's stressful for any plant, which is why there are so few species in the world that are uniquely adapted to grow in the coastal zone. And you know, in the 70 or so mangrove species globally, some of the few that are able to do that. And so they're able to tolerate these kind of conditions. So if we plant mangrove uh, seedlings in places where they cannot tolerate, then they're not gonna grow. Um, so we see in Southeast Asia, a lot of uh, planting on seagrass meadows, um, particularly in the Philippines, but also elsewhere. And of course that is a great location for seagrass, but it's a terrible place for mangroves. If mangroves could grow there, they would already be there. And so, and we're just converting another blue carbon habitat and, and destroying that one instead. Or we might plant mangroves in abandoned aquaculture ponds, you know, because that was the cause of mangrove loss. The aquaculture goes out of productivity, the ponds are abandoned. So there's lots of efforts to try and restore those mangroves. When you dig aquaculture ponds, however, you often dig a meter or more deep so you completely change the hydrology, the elevation of the surface, the tidal flooding regime and everything. And so if you plant mangroves in those places that have been modified, they're not going to grow. And so we have, it sounds great that we have over 3000 square kilometers of mangroves, uh, of area available for mangrove restoration, but we're not able to do restoration at that scale yet um, for all of these kind of issues. Um, yeah, so even if it's the, the site generally is biophysically suitable, once you zoom in, it may not be. But it's not just the biophysical constraints uh, to restoration. Uh, there's also a number of uh, socioeconomic and governance constraints. And this is a paper that came out from the center earlier this year uh, that, that looked at the constraints on, on restoration and reforestation for a number of ecosystems and mangroves were just one of them. And it, and it showed that you know, you have this biophysical suitability, but once you start adding on all of these socioeconomic and land use and operational constraints, actually the area of uh, available for restoration gets a lot lower because, you know, at, in those 3000 square kilometers of abandoned areas suitable for mangrove restoration, we may not know the land tenure for many of those areas. Uh, it may not be financially viable to do restoration. It may, you may make more money by doing aquaculture. So, you know, it's hard to persuade people to, to stop that up, um, and to put mangroves in its place. Or maybe the sites are too far away and there's not enough uh, labor sources uh, to do restoration, or there are other land use constraints uh, that don't allow us to do it at the sort of scale that we want to. So once you, you think about the biophysical constraints and then all of these socioeconomic and governance constraints, then for mangrove restoration, out of that 3000 square kilometers, maybe five to 34% of it is suitable uh, for restoration once you take into account all of these other constraints. And so, you know, you'll, you'll see a lot of bold targets uh, for restoration, uh, certainly, you know, to the end of this decade from, from uh, governments and NGOs and, and other parties. And, and it's really difficult. Uh, it's great that there's that ambition uh, to do restoration on those scales, but it is really challenging. Um, and we have to fix a lot of these constraints, but you know, a lot of them are fixable. Uh, we just have to think about how to do it. So, blue carbon at the, at the global scale might be uh, not the most appropriate. So what is the most appropriate scale uh, to do blue carbon? Well, certainly there are some countries uh, where blue carbon could make a big contribution at the, at the national scale. And these are often countries that, that maybe have low emissions, uh, and uh, but maybe high deforestation rates and, and long coastlines. So they have a large blue carbon extent. And so, mangroves can make a national contribution to, to carbon offsetting. But I think really the, the power of blue carbon is at the local scale. Um, and there was this uh, great 
study, which was the, the PhD project of Clint Cameron. And uh, Clint basically went to Sulawesi and, and, and did the, the entire um, carbon budget uh, for uh, natural and restored mangroves in Sulawesi and showed that you know, restoration projects on some of these sites could maybe sequester about you know, 28 tons of carbon dioxide per hectare per year. Um, and then depending on how you do the accounting, we could you know, get that up to almost 70 tons of carbon dioxide per year, if you count other con um, carbon sequestration contributors such as algae in the site. I mean, even the minimum scenario of, of carbon sequestration was still 17 uh, tons of, of carbon dioxide per year. And when we compare that to uh, particularly terrestrial projects, and these are projects on this graph that come from the uh, VCS, a voluntary carbon standard project database, where they're generally getting between 10 and 14 tons of carbon dioxide per hectare per year. Then again, at the local scale, uh, mangrove restoration can really give you multiple times more benefit per hectare than these, some of these other projects. So, so there is a role for mangrove blue carbon, and particularly at these local scales. And, and local scale okay, may not have a huge impact on the global um, climate, but it's going to have a huge impact on um, local uh, carbon offsets, but also local livelihoods uh, and, um, and impacts on local communities. And this kind of brings me on to my, my last point is that the, the focus on blue carbon solely, uh, and, and, and this is a point for carbon generally, but uh, particularly for blue carbon, I think, yeah, we, we can't, um, yeah, sometimes we don't see the forest for the trees, right? And we, and we focus so much on blue carbon that we sometimes kind of forget or don't appreciate a much more holistic view of the benefits of blue carbon ecosystems. And so these are just some of the benefits that mangroves provide. They support fisheries, they provide construction materials, they're a huge source of income for ecotourism, and they can uh, be a reservoir of really unique uh, biodiversity, as well as all the other ecosystem services that we associate with, with mangrove forests. And so by protecting blue carbon, we also protect these co-benefits. Um, I don't really like the phrase co-benefits because it always kind of suggests that carbon is first and these other ones are just, uh, you know, co or added on. But um, really, if we think about the mangrove ecosystem and other blue carbon ecosystems much more holistically, then carbon is a very important part, but it's just one of many benefits that they provide. So instead of focusing on selling blue carbon credits to protect mangrove forests, why can't we sell mangrove credits? Why can't we focus on the ecosystem and the benefits it provides instead of one benefit or ecosystem service? Um, because mangroves are much more than just their carbon. And honestly, you know, when we go and, and do field work around Southeast Asia and we speak with various stakeholders that we work with, um, and particularly local communities, blue carbon is not really in the top 10 most important benefits that that mangrove provides. Um, to the hundreds of millions of people that rely on mangrove forests across the tropics. And the last benefit I think that blue carbon really plays is that it's a fantastic communication tool. And even in Singapore, uh, there's been a number of newspaper articles, uh, a number of Channel News Asia documentaries. We just filmed another one uh, last weekend about uh, mangrove carbon. And so it's a way that um, gets other audiences beyond nature conservationists to think about uh, mangrove forest and conservation because I think most people are getting an awareness now that carbon is very important uh, and we're seeing it in a lot of policy. And so this is one communication tool that other stakeholders may be more comfortable with than rather than talking about biodiversity, et cetera. And this is whether it's for the public or also we found it really useful for policymakers. Um, so this was the Deputy Prime Minister of, of Singapore uh, doing a Facebook post about uh, our blue carbon study, uh, a mangrove carbon study in Singapore. And so, you know, this is a unique opportunity for, for people at very high levels to be able to communicate the importance of carbon. And so I think um, 
we've seen a lot of traction in using carbon as a way of, of um, getting people interested in conservation. So uh, just to wrap up, um, you know, it's clear that Southeast Asia is a, a real hotspot of mangrove blue carbon, but unfortunately it's also a hotspot of blue carbon loss. And so we have to reconcile these two somehow. And I think blue carbon does give us a pretty unique opportunity to incentivize for conservation and trying to reduce this loss. And this is because blue carbon is so great, um, though with some of the caveats uh, that I talked about. And so blue carbon is awesome in locations where it's most appropriate. And so there definitely is a key role for blue carbon, but I think we also have to use blue carbon as one of many tools uh, if we're going to be able to do coastal habitat conservation at the sort of scale we need to help the global climate, but also to help local livelihoods and communities that rely on these resources. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan, for your fantastic and insightful talk. Uh, I think giving us a bit of hope and, and reality check uh, at the same time um, when it comes to the role and contribution of mangroves uh, uh, to climate mitigation at the global scale, especially uh, compared to other nature-based solutions. Uh, maybe to quote uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, um, the numbers don't lie. So as scientists, uh, it is our job to present the evidence unbiased and, and free of any agenda. I think uh, mangroves are still hugely important for the, for the many reasons you mentioned uh, beyond climate uh, mitigation and adaptation. So, so thank you for being our Dr. Fauci of uh, mangrove conservation and restoration as, uh, as nature-based uh, solutions. We will now be opening the floor for questions. Uh, you may submit your questions via poll EV. I think we will have a slide coming up soon. Uh, and, and you are also able to upvote uh, other questions that people submit, uh, questions that you find interesting as well. Um, so I think the, the link to poll EV is, is on the chat, in the chat panel. It's just a pollev.com slash cncs. Okay, I'll... Um... Yep, I think we have the questions up. Uh, so Dan, please, please go ahead and address whichever ones you want to do first. Sure, well, they're, they're moving a bit too fast for me to see. <laughs> um, but I, I can answer, I'll answer the top one about how long does it take for a newly restored mangrove to sequester the same amount of carbon as more established mangrove forests? Now, uh, this is a really important question because you know, we can restore all this area, but there will be a lag um, because of a very small plant is obviously not able to sequester the, the same amount of carbon uh, as, a, as a larger tree. Now, the great thing about restored sites is that their rate of carbon accumulation is much is is really fast and much greater than established forest. But generally, and generally on a restored site, if all the conditions are right and it and it, you know, and it goes well and successful, then even within a couple of years, you can have a lot of biomass uh, in the restored site. But generally, it takes some of our studies have shown about thirty to forty years for the biomass. Um, carbon to return to the same sort of pre-disturbed state. So maybe 30 to 40 years for the biomass. Uh, the, car the soil carbon um, is much trickier and really depends on the type of disturbance that was experienced beforehand. Um, so that's something that we don't have such a good handle on at the moment. Certainly the soil uh, takes, um, you know, it follows uh, the biomass in, in some respects. Um, but certainly you can get a forest that looks like a mangrove forest, you know, relatively quickly. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, how can remote sensing be used in blue carbon analysis? We don't use a lot of remote sensing in blue carbon analysis. We have a lot of standardized protocols to measure uh, mangrove and seagrass, blue carbon in particular, and particularly in the soils. Um, but most of them, are, they're all kind of filled um, protocols really and we the, the use of remote sensing is a little bit more limited uh, but this is really I think one of the bigger frontiers and something we're going to see a lot more um, I've shown you a few examples in the slides like the the Singapore 
uh, mangrove carbon model was a combination of remote sensing and field based. And it really showed the importance of doing remote sensing because that study showed to us the huge spatial variation in carbon. So if we take just a couple of field measurements and average them up, we're missing a lot of variation that we saw in, in Singapore, for example. So capturing that gives us a much more robust and, and much more large scale and rapid uh, assessment. And, and there are some new uh, remote satellite remote sensing products that are online now, um, such as there is a, a LIDAR instrument on the International Space Station as we speak, and it is able to collect three dimensional forest structure. And that is a tool which I think will be really useful to map um, global carbon stocks and particularly blue carbon. Uh, all of this I've talked about for remote sensing though is about the biomass, the tree, because that's the thing that we can most easily see uh, from a satellite remote sensing image is, is the vegetation. What we are struggling to do at the moment is model the carbon, uh, the soil carbon. Um, and you know, in mangroves, 60 or 70% of the carbon may be in the soil. And at the moment, remote sensing is, is, um, is not getting us quite to that stage. There, there was a, um, a paper that I just saw uh, that a, a colleague emailed to me yesterday that showed uh, some attempts to start modeling uh, soil carbon at larger scales. So I think there's definitely work on that. Um, so remote sensing, I think, is a key tool in blue carbon analysis, but we're still having to push it um, further. Yeah, thank you. Uh, is there a model of um, forest restoration which might inform future efforts in the region? Uh, certainly there is, um, there is a model of, uh, for mangroves uh, particularly, there is a model of restoration potential. And this is the model that I, I mentioned, suggested that there were 3,000 square kilometers uh, of mangrove, formerly mangrove areas suitable for restoration. And that model is freely available online at, um, I think it's mappingoceanwealth.org. Uh, so that model is there. Um, for models of kind of what this means for carbon uh, and what this might mean for the region's carbon, uh, stay tuned and come back to us soon. Um, and we will, we may have some more information on that. These questions that we are very interested in. Thanks. I'm unfortunately not able to scroll down. Is someone able to scroll down and see some other questions? Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, so to what extent does uh, do mangroves release methane? Um, and how might this offset some of the benefits of mangroves? This, this is a really important question, something that we, we are only now starting to address because I think our knowledge of methane fluxes uh, in mangroves uh, is getting a bit better. So methane is important because it's many times more potent as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So you don't need nearly as much methane to have uh, the same sort of impact as carbon dioxide. And, and a, a few studies that have come out in the last year or two, particularly from Australia, have shown that uh, methane emissions from mangroves may offset maybe 20% of carbon sequestration from mangroves. So that's a, a, a decent amount which we have to account for. Um, there was another study that showed uh, also from Australia because there was a, a dieback uh, that happened over a large extent in northern Australia and they calculated the methane emissions from that and standing trees really do release some methane. But what that study showed was that dead mangroves and degraded mangroves release even more uh, methane. Uh, as do things like abandoned aquaculture ponds. So, so while mangroves do release some methane, if we can maintain them in a healthy condition, or if we can put them on land surfaces that are emitting even more methane, then again, we can quantify that benefit that mangroves are providing. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's a bit of a balance, but certainly mangroves have a role to play in reducing methane emissions as well as uh, releasing them themselves. Thank you. Um, do we know anyone working on mangrove 
credit schemes. Um, there's a lot of people starting to work on mangrove blue carbon credit schemes, but this kind of general mangrove credit scheme uh, that I talked about is was really just a, an idea. Um, but certainly people are interested in, in bundling co-benefits alongside carbon. So it may not be a credit for the whole ecosystem, um, but there is interest in, if you take the blue carbon credit price, can you add a few extra dollars for conserving biodiversity or another ecosystem service? And certainly people are thinking about that. Um, but the criteria for such a scheme uh, would be quite challenging. Uh, and I think this is why we don't see so much of it. Carbon, despite all of its challenges, is one of the easier ecosystem services to quantify. And obviously, if we're going to, quant if we're going to sell carbon credits, we have to be able to quantify it in a way that's trustworthy and transparent and robust. And so whatever methods we use to measure or estimate those co-benefits to get a broader mangrove credit, uh, the, the criteria have to be very clear and transparent and, and, and subject to revision uh, as we get more information coming in. Thanks. Uh, how relevant are mangroves to, to Singapore? And in particular, can they protect rising sea levels and climate change? I mean, obviously I'm gonna say they're hugely important. Um, and I really do think they are based, you know, a lot of our research has, has surprised me at how important our mangroves are, even in Singapore, where we don't have a lot. They're very fragmented. Um, they're in various, they experience various degrees of stress and disturbance, and yet they hang on. Um, they're, they're survivors and they're, and they're, they're now a, a kind of an integral part of our coastal fabric and they are providing a lot of benefits. I mean, they're providing the carbon, uh, they're, they are supporting uh, fish communities uh, in Singapore and we, we don't have a huge amount of, of kind of commercial fisheries, uh, but we have some, but we also have a lot of recreational fisheries, uh, which can be worth a lot of money in Singapore. So mangroves are, are strongly contributing to that. Um, and what's great, and I think the biggest contribution that our mangroves make is, is how accessible they are. And so there's a whole set of cultural ecosystem services and benefits and the fact that we can get so close to them um, because a lot of the sites are accessible and they have boardwalks and other infrastructure uh, that we can do a lot of recreation, education, tourism, uh, et cetera. So Sungai Bulo Wetland Reserve, um, every you know, every so often I go on TripAdvisor and sometimes it, Sungai Bulo Wetland Reserve pops into the top three attractions in Singapore below, you know, Gardens by the Bay. And the fact that people do travel from all over the world to come to Sungai Bulo because it is a uh, internationally recognized uh, bird migratory stop-off point. And so, you know, there's a lot of these cultural benefits and our personal interactions, which I think uh, in Singapore mangroves are playing a really important role. So I don't think we should uh, dismiss the role of mangroves in Singapore, even though they're a relatively small extent. And I think certainly the research uh, that we've been doing on ecosystem services and benefits just gives even more incentive to protect what we have and to restore and increase mangrove area in the future. Thank you. Hey Dan, I might just jump in and, and uh, highlight one of the questions, which I think is really interesting. So the question is, uh, wh what happens to mangroves under sea level rise? Uh, if they get flooded, uh, does the carbon get released? Yeah, uh, this is a, a, it sounds like a straightforward question, but it's, this is actually one that recent science is showing is much more complex. So generally, if you, if mangroves are flooded uh, more than they can tolerate, then eventually they will uh, revert to a, um, the species that can't tolerate will die off. And eventually, if none of the species can tolerate, then the whole ecosystem would die off and it would convert itself to an unvegetated mudflat, um, you know, which is found at, at lower elevations uh, in our coast. And so the general thinking was that, yeah, if mangroves are threatened by sea level rise, then the ecosystem would be destroyed. And a lot of that carbon, particularly in the biomass, would be released pretty quickly as it dies. But there would also be maybe a, a, a very quick release of carbon in the soil um, as the roots that are holding the soil together die and that would get flushed out into the sea but then also there would might be some longer term 
uh, fluxes and emissions from the soil, uh, even after the mangrove is gone. And that's the general thinking, and I think that's certainly important in, in places where mangroves cannot adapt to sea level rise. But actually, sea level rise might also help uh, in carbon accumulation. And there was a, a fantastic study uh, from the University of Wollongong and Macquarie University and others last year that, that really showed the capacity for mangroves to be able to accumulate carbon under certain sea level scenarios as well, because mangroves can either adapt and rise with sea level rise, and that creates more space to, to um, trap uh, and accumulate carbon. And also in places where they're allowed to, if mangroves can migrate landwards to higher elevations under sea level rise, they can again uh, accumulate more carbon. So it's a much more complex question than we thought. And it's really a balance of this, the loss in areas where mangroves are being lost due to sea level rise and gains where mangroves are maybe able to increase or stabilize during sea level rise. So, so does that have an implication for, for mangrove restoration? Because I would imagine then we need to be really careful where we restore mangroves, right? Because if we uh, plant them in places where they wouldn't be able to outgrow or up you know, up, upgrow sea level rise, and they, they may be doing more harm than good in, in, in the long term. Yeah, we, we, when we think about restoration, it would be great if we could do our kind of due diligence and think about, is this the right place? And is it still going to be the right place in 50 years time? Because we don't want to restore just for 10 years. We want to restore and lock up that carbon uh, for as many decades as possible. And unfortunately, that's not really something we do much in mangrove restoration. Mangrove restoration at the moment is still relatively opportunistic and wherever, because of all those constraints, um, it's, a, it's a struggle to find sites that are suitable anyways, let alone are they suitable for sea level rise. But I think if we're talking about these huge uh, ambitious goals of you know, hundreds of thousands of hectares of mangrove restoration, then we need to future-proof them a little bit as well. Um, and make sure they're in the conditions that will give them uh, the best chance of success and the highest resilience. And these are places that uh, in, in our region, at least our mangroves require a lot of sediment to keep pace with sea level rise. And so we have to make sure that there's enough sediment in the water and that, and that we're not damming rivers to, to block sediment, et cetera, or that they have space to migrate inland uh, as sea levels rise. So I, I think if we want to really you know, make the most of all of this funding and, and, and attention that's going into huge ambitious mangrove restoration, we have to plan for the future. Yeah. Right, thanks, thanks Dan. Um, maybe uh, we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, the, the other one that is somewhat related uh, is, is this about whether there are examples of mangroves being restored without direct planting uh, of, of the mangrove uh, proper gills, I suppose, um, as, as opposed to assisted natural regeneration. I guess, so, so the question is about assisted natural regeneration versus uh, more, more active, uh, proactive planting of, of, the, of the mangroves. Yeah, so while, uh, you know, most mangrove restoration is kind of planting of single species in rows, there are huge efforts now um, to go beyond that, seeing that it, of, it often is not successful. And assisted natural regeneration, or uh, another technique we call it, is by ecological mangrove restoration. And it basically means working with the environment, not against the environment. So if we know what, the, what um, stops mangroves from growing, then we reduce, yeah, we take, get rid of those barriers and we fix, we do our homework, we fix the site before we plant anything. Or maybe if we fix the site so the conditions are suitable for mangroves, we may not even have to plant. But natural um, processes such as propagules floating in on the tide will naturally find their suitable place and will grow. And there are some fantastic uh, NGOs and examples of this in Thailand and Indonesia, uh, where within a couple of years, you, know, you need a machete to get through the forest and you know, not a single mangrove was planted. You know? but, what they did was instead of spending money on planting and nurseries and things, they put those um, resources into site evaluation and fixing the drainage and fixing the constraints that were stopping mangroves growing in the first place. So as I said earlier, mangroves are like weeds. If you if the conditions are right, you know, they'll 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 grow at a, a rapid rate without any of our help. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Dan. 
I, I think that's all the time we have for today. Uh, thank you once again for taking the time to share your work. And, and also thanks everyone for your uh, active participation and questions. Uh, please don't leave here. We, we, we want to be able to take a group photo. Um, but also before that, I just want to say if, if you have questions uh, that we couldn't get to uh, due to time constraints, please, please feel free to reach out to Dan or, or the center and, and we'll try to get those questions uh, addressed. So uh, for the last two minutes, uh, let's, let's try to take a group photo and I'll hand it to Zhang Xie to help coordinate this.